Psalm 145 is a beautiful psalm, praising God for who he is and for what he does. In the Hebrew text, this psalm has a title, a prescript, so to speak. It is simply titled, A Praise of David. Now, even though Psalms 17 and 86 were also called a prayer of David, This is the only one of the 150 Psalms that has the title, A Praise of David. And indeed, it is what you might call a high point of praise. James Montgomery Boyce, in his commentary on the book of Psalms, says, Psalm 145 is indeed a monumental praise psalm, a fit summary of all David had learned about God during a long lifetime of following hard after the Almighty. Psalm 145 is the last psalm attributed to David in the collection of the 150 psalms. And it is also the last of the nine psalms that uses some kind of acrostic pattern. Uh, We find this also in Psalms 9, 10, 25, 34, 37, 111, 112, of course, Psalm 119, and then here in Psalm 145. Five of the nine acrostic psalms are attributed to David. The acrostic pattern simply follows where there's some arrangement according to the layout of the Hebrew alphabet, where lines in the original text will begin with successive letters of the Hebrew alphabet. If you were to transfer that to the English alphabet, the first line would begin with the letter A, the second line would begin with the letter B, and so forth and so on throughout the psalm. Willem van Gemeren, in his commentary on Psalm 145, said that in Jewish practice, this psalm was recited twice in the morning and once in the evening service. He said that the Talmud commends all who repeat it three times a day as having a share in the world to come. This is a marvelous psalm of praise. And as we've said before, with this psalm, we leave David's contributions, or at least his attributed contributions, to the book of Psalms. So let's take a look at this beautiful psalm, Psalm 145, beginning now with the first three verses. This is what David says, sort of setting an example of praise here in the first three verses. We read this. I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Notice here in the first verse, David begins with this very emphatic beginning, I will extol you, my God, O King. Now, we don't often use the word in the English vocabulary to extol, but to extol is to praise, to lift high, to exalt, And here, David honored and promoted the name of God in the most personal of ways. Again, notice that phrase, I will extol you, my God, O King. First, he began with a direct address, you. Then he did it with a personal reference, my God. Then he did it with a surrendered heart when he said, O King, recognizing God as King. And then he also did it unendingly, where he says in verse 1 that he would do it forever and ever, and then repeating again in verse 2, saying, Every day I will bless you. (laughs) So this is wonderful praise. It's personal. It's surrendered. It's unending. This is powerful and beautiful praise, especially, I would say, when David says of the Lord, addressing him as king. It says, I will extol you, my God, O king. Because understand this, almost certainly when David uttered this psalm, he was a king. We assume that this comes from David's later life when he had sat on the throne of Israel for some time. For David to call God his king, 
really uh, puts in perspective the fact that David understood that whatever royal uh, title he possessed, it was definitely below that of the king of kings. And therefore, he recognizes that God is his king. I want you to also notice that David was absolutely determined to praise God. There are several uses of the phrase, I will, in this section. I will extol you. I will bless you. Every day, I will bless you. I will praise your name. That's just in the first two verses, four times, in some ways, David says, I will praise you. Now, it's often foolish for us to say, I will, because our will can be very weak. It can be very indecisive. But when we decide to praise God, then we should say it again and again. We should say it just like David did. I will, I will, I will, and I will. Four times is not enough to confirm your decision to give praise unto God. Now, David piled praise upon praise as we come to verse 3, where David said, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Here he is declaring God's greatness and God's great worthiness to be praised. We get the feeling that David felt that it would be dishonorable for him to withhold his praise to God. It would be dishonoring to God to give him half hearted praise. So he's going to continue on in that spirit of tremendous praise unto God. Now at verses four through seven, where we read this, one generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. Men shall speak of the might of your awesome acts and I will declare your greatness. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness. I love how this section, beginning at verse 4, begins. It begins with the declaration, One generation shall praise your works to another. David looked for God's people to encourage each other in praise. And here, most specifically in verse 4, he has the idea of that encouragement crossing generational lines. An older generation might inspire a younger generation to praise by remembering God's mighty acts in the past. Then again, a young generation might stir up praise in an older generation by declaring the fresh and new things that God is doing in the present time. It's beautiful to think how one generation can praise God's works to another generation. John Trapp said this upon that idea of the generations praising to one another. He said, God's praises are many and man's life is short and one generation succeeds another. Let them relate God's wonderful works one to another and so perpetuate his praises to all posterity. You know, God is worthy of more praise than one generation can give him. So it has to be generation praising to generation to generation until the end of time and on into eternity. Spurgeon said this, he said, the generations shall in this unite. Together they shall make up an extraordinary history. Each generation shall contribute its chapter, and all the generations together shall compose a volume of matchless character. Indeed they shall. So after this beautiful idea of one generation praising to the other, here in verse 5 David says, I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. You see, praise not only comes from emotion. Believe me, there's a place for emotion, for deep feeling in praise, but it also comes from careful thought, from careful meditation. That's why David says, 
I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty right there in verse 5. David meditated not only on the great things God did, that's his wondrous works. I I will meditate on your wondrous works. He mentions that in verse 5. But he also paid attention to God's glorious splendor. Both of those things were true. And the idea behind that idea, the glorious splendor of God is of the glory and the wonder of who God actually is. So there were both things at work here. David definitely praised God for who he is. And then he also praised God for what God does. Spurgeon said this relevant to this verse. He said, It seems then, dear friends, that David studied the character and doings of God and thus praised him. Knowledge should lead our song. The more we know of God, the more acceptably shall we bless him through Jesus Christ. There is a real place for thoughtful meditation leading to our praise. And if I could say this very directly to you, this is a problem with much of our praise to God today. Much of our praise in what you might call the Western evangelical church is really all given just a basis on feeling or emotion. I feel wonderful, and so I praise God. I feel emotional, and so I praise Him. And I'm not trying to separate praise from feeling. God forbid. But what I'm saying is we can also praise God based on our deep meditation upon His glorious splendor, upon His wondrous works. And when we think of the aspects of God's glorious splendor, His majesty, His wisdom, His constant presence, His complete knowledge, His unlimited power, His loving and wise plan and purpose, when we think about all those aspects of His glorious splendor, all of this should stir up praise within us. But that's not all. Verse 5 tells us that we should also praise him for his wondrous works. God's works of planning, his work of creation, his works of providence, his works of rescue, his works of salvation now and in the age to come. All of this should stir up praise within us. So much so that we should be declaring it to one another. Look at it here in verse 6. Men shall speak of the might of your awesome acts, and I will declare your greatness. To give emphasis, David repeated the idea of praising God for who he is and for what he has done. Repeating idea the third time, we remember the demonstration of God's great goodness in what he does, declare your greatness, And that God declares himself that he himself is full of righteousness in who he is. Charles Spurgeon quoted a writer named LeBlanc on this phrase in verse 6, I will declare your greatness. I found this interesting. Again, LeBlanc writes this. All men are enamored of greatness. Then they must seek it in God and get it from God. David did both. All history shows the creature aspiring after this glory. Ahasuerus, Ahasuerus, Cyrus, Cambyses, Nebuchadnezzar were all called the great. Alexander the Great, when he came to the Ganges, ordered his statue to be made of more than life size that posterity might be believe, might believe him to have been of nobler stature. In Christ alone does man attain the greatness his heart yearns for, the glory of perfect goodness. We are attracted to greatness because of something that God has put within us. And we see it so twisted in our modern age. And I'm not saying that it only began to be twisted in our modern age. I'm just saying that we see it so twisted in our modern age. But we see it today when people are so given over to a love and attraction and interest. You might even say a worship of celebrity, a worship of 
power and political power and those who are powerful, a, a, a worship of those who are great in the eyes of the world. That is basically coming from something inside of us that is drawn to greatness. Let me tell you something, dear friend, that desire uh, to, to look at, to observe, to love greatness, that was meant for us to have it satisfied in God himself. Therefore, we should say right alongside with David in verse 6, I will declare your greatness. Now, let's continue on. David's going to continue on this marvelous theme of praise, verses 8 and 9. He says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. David here in verse 8 echoes the self-description that the Lord gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. This is what the Lord declared about himself when God revealed himself to Moses on Mount Sinai. You'll find it in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. He said, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. Now, do you see where David's words in verse 8 are meant to be an echo of that thought? In verse 8, David said, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. That same gracious God that revealed himself to Moses on Mount Sinai, that same gracious God comes and draws near to his people today. And David thought about the gracious nature of God, that he is full of compassion, slow to anger, and great in mercy, just as revealed in Exodus chapter 34. And when David did this, he understood that, as Alexander McLaren said, that greatness, majesty, splendor are not the divinest parts of the divine nature, as this singer had learned. These are but the fringes of the central glory. Therefore, the song rises from greatness to celebrate greater things, the moral attributes of Jehovah. Leaving David to declare in verse 9, the Lord is good to all. When David said that, he expressed the idea that theologians sometimes call common grace. That is, that God spreads some of his goodness to all of humanity, indeed all of creation. Jesus uh, expressed this idea in the Sermon on the Mount when he said this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 45. He makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. There is such a thing as common grace, the goodness that God shows to all. Therefore, David saw it and said it. He praised God for this, saying in verse 9, the Lord is good to all. And then following up in verse 9, his tender mercies are all over his works. David saw the beautiful care of God pressed upon all that he did, all creation, and all the wise plan of God were demonstrations of the greatness and the goodness of the Almighty. George Horn, writing in his commentary a couple hundred years ago, where he gives a commentary on each one of the Psalms, he had a very interesting comment on this phrase, tender mercies, here in verse 9 of Psalm 145. This is what Horn says. He says, the original word for his tender mercies signifies the womb. The mercies of God toward men are therefore represented by this word to be like those of a mother toward the child of her womb. Let me put it to you this way. If you have ever seen a mother dote over her infant child, you have seen a glimpse of God's 
tender mercies. Indeed, this is the greatness of God's care and worthy for us to praise him about. Now, verse 10 through 13, we see this. All your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Notice this, as David continues on this wonderful theme of praise, in verse 10, he declares unto the Lord, All your works shall praise you, O Lord. David recognized that there is a real sense in which creation itself praises God, and it does so out of grateful duty. Yet even more than the rivers and the hills praising God, as you see in Psalm 98, for example, God's people should praise him. That's why he says there in verse 10, and your saints shall bless you. Yes, it's wonderful if creation praises the Lord, but God's people, his saints, should even more gratefully praise and bless the Lord. You look around at everything God has created, and there is reason for those things to give praise unto God. After all, God created them, and in some sense you can say that God sustains them, reasons for them to praise the Lord. But we have even greater reason to praise God. Not only has God created you, but if you are among God's people, if you have put your trust in Jesus Christ, in who he is and what he has done for you, especially what he did in being the payment for your sins at the cross and in his victory over sin and death at the empty tomb, if you are born again by God's Spirit, God has a double claim upon your praise. You should praise him as your creator, and you should also praise him as your redeemer, your savior. So if creation has reason to praise God, and I believe that it does, how the people of God have even greater reason to praise him. That's why he says here in verse 11, they shall speak of the glory of your kingdom. What a wonderful subject for the speech of God's people. You know, there's a lot of things that we talk about. We talk about the weather. We talk about the economy. We talk about politics. We talk about sports. We talk about a lot of things. But all too little do we speak of the glory of God's kingdom. And all too little do we speak of his great power. That's what it says we should do in verse 11. We should talk of your power, David says, unto the Lord. If we have received his grace, we should be messengers of his grace. Why? Verse 12 tells us, to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. David again sensed the responsibility of God's people to tell the wider world the greatness of what God has done. In other words, his mighty acts. To tell the world who our king is, verse 12 says that we should speak of the glorious majesty of his kingdom. It really is one of the great lacks of the church today that we don't do enough of what is spoken out in verse 11, talk of God's power, or we don't do enough of what's spoken of in verse 12, to make known to the sons of men the greatness of God. Sometimes we think that the world needs more preaching. Well, maybe it does. I'm a preacher. I guess I always think that the world needs more preaching. But I'll tell you what the world probably needs more than more Christian preaching. It needs more Christian talking. Just Christians talking about the great things of God. Telling others of the greatness of the Lord we have communed with, about the God who answers prayer, about the God who has done mighty things in our life, about the God who has, as it says here in verse 13, an everlasting kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. You know, verse 2 says that this praise to God should last 
forever and ever. David said, I will praise your name forever and ever. You know, one reason why God's praise should last forever and ever is because God's kingdom will last forever. His dominion is unending. It will last throughout all generations. I like what Charles Spurgeon said about this. He said, men come and go like shadows on the wall, but God reigns eternally. We distinguish kings as they succeed each other by calling them the first and the second. But this king is Jehovah, the first and the last. And his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. F.B. Meyer, who wrote in the first half of the 20th century, had an interesting comment on that phrase, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And it was true of his day. I can't say that I know that it's true of the present day. But but this is what was true of F.B. Meyer's day. He said this, These words, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, are engraved on the door of a mosque in Damascus, which was formerly a Christian church. Originally, Those engraved words were plastered over by stucco, but the stucco dropped away and the words stand out clearly defined. They seem to be contradicted by centuries of Islam, but they are essentially true. Brothers and sisters, your kingdom, God's kingdom, is an everlasting kingdom and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, I told you at the beginning of our look at Psalm 145 that it is acrostic in its arrangement. In other words, this psalm has 21 verses. However, there are 22 letters to the Hebrew alphabet. It means that each of the verses begins with a successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet all through the alphabet with one exception because we're missing one letter. So Derek Kidner noted that in the acrostic arrangement of Psalm 145, one letter, I'm quoting now, one letter of the alphabet, nun, is lacking from the standard Hebrew text. But most of the ancient translations, and now a text from Qumran, supply the missing verse, which the Revised Standard Version and subsequent translations include at the end of verse 13. Well, it's just sort of interesting to consider that, that uh, for whatever reason, there was that particular verse perhaps missing, and now it was given something starting with the Hebrew letter Nun. All right, that having said, on to verse 14 where David is going to praise God for his great kindness to those who are in need. Verses 14, 15, and 16, where David says this, The Lord upholds all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look expectantly to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Beautiful words, but let's look at it line by line here. Verse 14, David says, The Lord upholds all who fall. God's compassion is especially evident towards those who fall and fail. He does not despise or reject them. There is a sense in which God specially draws near to those who fall to hold them up. If they allow their fall to rightly humble them, God will draw near and uphold them. It's a beautiful statement, isn't it? The Lord upholds all who fall. And again, according to Derek Kidner, this phrase Uh, is unusually expressive. He quotes how the New English Bible says this, and how God straightens the backs which are bent. With that understanding of the translation, Charles Spurgeon said this, 
many are despondent and cannot lift up their heads in courage or their hearts with comfort, but these he cheers. Some are bent with their daily load, and these he strengthens. It's fascinating how in this last section of the psalm, we find a word repeated again and again and again. It's the word all. The word all is going to occur 11 times in this section of verses. And as Alexander McLaren said, he said, the singer seems to delight in the very sound of the word all, which suggests to him boundless visions of the wide sweep of God's universal mercy and of the numberless crowd of dependents who wait on him and are satisfied by him. So much so that verse 15 says, the eyes of all look expectantly to you and you give them their food in due season. The humble put their expectation on God, looking to him for their needs. So they pray. They they pray just like Jesus told us to pray in Matthew chapter 6. They pray, give us this day our daily bread, and God answers their prayer in due season. Now, most commentators connect this with the words, every living thing that follow. In other words, they see that all creation is in view. It's a beautiful figure. As Adam Clark said, what a fine picture. The young of all animals look up to their parents for food. God is here represented as the universal father providing food for every living creature. As a matter of fact, in verse 16, he says, You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. God's care for creation extends beyond his provision for men and women. As God would later say, God, excuse me, as Jesus, being God, would later say, God also cares for the birds and the grass of the field. Again, as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6, God does this with a wonderfully open hand and an open heart to his creation. As we take in David's amazing description of God, we see how different Yahweh, the true and living God, how different Yahweh is compared to the idols of the nations. Those supposed gods were often angry and petulant that they cared little for either humanity or for creation. We are surprised and grateful for the love and the care that we receive from the God who is really there. Now, let's read this last section of Psalm 145. I'm going to begin at verse 17 and continue all the way through the end of verse 21 and the end of this psalm. We read this. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, gracious in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry and save them. The Lord preserves all who love him, But the wicked, excuse me, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh shall bless his holy name forever and ever. Notice this in verse 17. David said this, The Lord is righteous in all his ways and gracious in all his works. Throughout this psalm, David has spoken much about how we should praise God for who he is and what he has done. Here again, David gives us a reason to praise the Lord, recognizing the incomparable combination of God being righteous and gracious. Notice that in verse 17. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, gracious in all his works. 
I suppose I could say that in one sense, it is easy to be either one or the other. To be completely righteous means that, well, you just toe the line and everything has to be right and everything has to be right according to the law and righteous in every regard. To be truly gracious is to have a love and a grace that covers over error, that covers over sin. How can God be so excellent in both righteousness and graciousness? Well, later, the Apostle Paul would write about this idea, how in the person and work of Jesus Christ, God did, and I'm going to quote Romans 3.26 to you now, demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. This combination of God, as Paul put it, being both just, that is righteous, as Psalm 145 would put it, and being the justifier, that's being gracious, as Psalm 145 would put it. You see, it's a beautiful thing that God is both righteous and gracious, both just and the justifier. And why? Because he loves. Look at it here in verse 18. The Lord is near to all who call upon him. God's responsiveness to his praying people demonstrates the graciousness that's mentioned in the previous lines. Matter of fact, verse 19 says, He will fulfill the desire and he will hear the cry of his people. To, as it says here in verse 19, to all who call upon him in truth. Again, that's verse 18, I mean. There is a uh, counterfeit way of calling upon God. There is such a thing as false or very superficial worship. But when we call upon him in truth, then God will fulfill our desire and hear the cry of his people. As a matter of fact, verse 19 says, he will fulfill the desires of those who fear him. In his commentary on this line of Psalm 145, John Trapp noted that Martin Luther prayed this to God. Again, notice, here's the line. He will fulfill the desires of those who fear him. Verse 19 of Psalm 145, Luther said this, Let my will be done. Luther was bold enough to pray that. Now, Trapp added that Luther could pray this because he could also say to God, because my will is for your will to be done and nothing else. And as long as my will is for God's will to be done, then I can pray to God, let my will be done. Verse 20 says, the Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. David here gave a further example of God's graciousness in action, preserving all who love him right along with his righteousness in action, all the wicked he will destroy. Where it says there, the Lord preserves all who love him. Derek Kidner, once again, is helpful in his comment. He says the sense of the original Hebrew word there isn't exactly preserves. It's much more watches over. In other words, it's not as if God insulates the godly, those who love him, from any kind of harm or difficulty, but he watches over them, even in the midst of their difficulty. So concluding this beautiful psalm now, verse 21, My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh shall bless his holy name forever and ever. I have to say that I sense that David meant this as a declaration. Having, having written so eloquently about who God is and what God has done for his people, David's firm decision was to use his mouth to praise and bless God
again and again. Again, as David says, my mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord. It's as if he said this, whatever anybody else is going to do, I am not going to keep quiet about the praise of the Lord. Whatever anybody else talks about, I'm going to speak about the greatness of God. I will praise the Lord God, and I will do it as long as I live. This last verse of Psalm 145, it's the last word that we have from David in the Bible. James Montgomery Boyce called this David's last will and testament. Do you want me to read you one more time? David's last will and testament. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh shall bless his holy name forever and ever. Boyce said this, If David had said nothing else in his long life, these words would be a fine legacy for future generations. In it, he praises God and he invites others to praise God also. I hope that's where your heart is at. You want to praise the Lord and you don't mind inviting other people to praise him as well. Now, before we leave this marvelous psalm, the last psalm in the entire collection attributed to David's authorship. Let's ask the question that we've been asking all through the book of Psalms. How does this psalm, Psalm 145, how does it point to Jesus? Well, I can suggest at least two ways to you. Number one, Jesus was and is the human embodiment of all God's nature and qualities. The great description of God in verses 8 and 9 in this psalm read like this. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. Now, I told you that David was deliberately making a connection to God's self-revelation to Moses on Mount Sinai. And I believe that's true. But we also see a forward connection. This is a description of Jesus in all of his nature, in all of his character, who is, after all, the image or the expression of the invisible God. Brothers and sisters, make no mistake about it. Do you want to see what God is like? Look to Jesus. And the God revealed in the person and work and teaching of Jesus Christ is this Lord who is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy, good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. That is the God presented to us. The human embodiment of all God's nature and qualities is Jesus Christ. That's one way that this psalm points to Jesus. Let me suggest you one more way. Jesus is the king of the everlasting kingdom. Verse 13 says, Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Friend, make no mistake about it. Jesus Christ is the king of that kingdom. The kingdom mentioned in verse 13 of Psalm 145, Jesus is the king of that kingdom. He is the king of kings, and he is the Lord of lords. He shall reign forever and ever. I know that there is a particular segment of that reign uh, marked out as a thousand years that we often call the millennium. I know there's a specific segment, but when the millennium ends, it does not end the reign of Jesus. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion endures throughout all generations. We praise Jesus, the king of that kingdom. Hey, let's seal this all to our hearts and our minds in prayer right now. Lord, we thank you for every contribution we've had from the pen of David, the sweet 
psalmist of Israel throughout all the psalms attributed to him. We thank you for this psalm, how it lifts up our hearts and minds in passionate praise to you. So we give you honor. We give you glory. We give you the praise that is due to your name. We declare unto you, Lord, the honor and the glory that you should have as the ever reigning king. We praise you right alongside David for all that you are and all that you have done. And we want to declare that praise throughout all generations. May it be so, Lord. And would you please receive our praise with pleasure. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.